afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Six Steps to Creating a Quantified Value Proposition. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. The presentation will last for approximately 40 minutes. You'll be able to send text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the question pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation, and we'll collect these and address as many as we can during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. And you'll be able to watch the webinar on demand via Exchange. Today's presenters are Professor Malcolm McDonald and Grant Oliver. So without further ado, I would now like to introduce Malcolm and Grant. Hello, I'm Malcolm McDonald. I'm an Emeritus Professor at Cranfield University School of Management and Chairman of six companies. Before I became a professor, I spent 15 years in marketing and sales, uh, culminating as Marketing and Sales Director of Canada Dry, where I had the privilege of directing a 200-strong sales force. I'd now like to introduce my colleague, Grant Oliver. Hello, um, I'm Grant Oliver, and I've spent 25 years working in with business-to-business -business products and services in many different sectors and countries around the world. <coughs> Interestingly, I spent the last two years advising the NHS in the UK on purchasing technology. And in addition, I'm a mentor to over 30 companies selling to the NHS. And it's rather like the Dragon's Den, for those of you who've seen that on the television. It's great fun for us as the mentors but it's very tough for the suppliers. Now this has been a rather sobering experience for me because these suppliers often cannot describe the problem that they are solving. In their presentations, they will show us 20 slides on the countries they operate in and a detailed history of the company. But I already know that because by the time they're in front of me, we've already done our research. What I want to know is what value and the return on investment do, do they bring to us? And does it make any sense to switch to them as a supplier? If they can't tell me the value, this causes the price to become the main negotiating point. And then the suppliers have a very, clo a very low close rate and the sales cycle just gets longer and longer. And in the NHS, and like in many businesses, we have to write business cases in order to make the purchase. And what I want to do is, to, is for the suppliers to provide that information for me. Uh, just to let you know, the slides and the white paper will be available um, after the event, and we will give you an email address later on. At this point, I'd just like to hand back to Malcolm. Hello again. Just over two years ago, Grant and I began to explore whether the statement by McKinsey that only 5% of companies have got value propositions was true, and if so, what we should do about it. Now, we estimate that it is a lot less than 5%. Um, I reckon it's between 2 and 3%. And Grant has been, as you've heard, appalled at the low quality of sales presentations by suppliers <clears throat> for what are frequently substantial investments by the National Health Service in technology. Accordingly, we researched the topic and found very little by way of actionable propositions. So we developed a rigorous process for developing financially quantified value propositions and tested it on a number of multinationals and small-medium enterprises. We're delighted to report that our process works and has been successfully adopted by our clients. We've recorded the process in our Kogan page book on the topic, which will be published in October this year, and we're pleased to be able to outline the process here in this webinar. Obviously, in such a short time, we can only outline the main steps. During the webinar, we need to answer the following three questions. What's the major problem we're all facing? Why we need to change? And what steps do we need to take um, to overcome these problems? Now, we've been researching global best practice key account management through a research club 
that I established 21 years ago at Cranfield, sponsored by companies like 3M, Siemens, Rolls-Royce and the like. The club is still going strong. In the club, I started and since I retired, we've insisted that 50% of uh, research presentations should come from buying directors. And over the years, we have learned a lot Now, most of the buying directors use a version of the slide shown here. You'll see if you look at the vertical axis, it says attractiveness high and low. Now, many of the buying directors have got it labeled either attractiveness or differentiation high and low, but it's about the same thing. And on the horizontal axis, you've got we buy a little on the left as opposed to we buy a lot. Now, I don't have time to go uh, into great detail here, but if you look at the top right where it says core, um, <clears throat> I'll give you one little case history from one buying director. He told us he'd got 1,300 suppliers. He'd only got 10 buyers, which in itself is interesting. But he'd only got 13 of the 1,300 that he considered uh, to be core and fundamental to uh, his business. And that's 1%. And <clears throat> the other statistics I got at Cranfield show that in the main, in most sectors, it's very rarely more than 1% of suppliers who are in that box at the top right where the customer buys a lot and they're different. And uh, interestingly, each of the buying directors we've had over the years say for those suppliers who are in the top right-hand box, they're prepared to pay between 15 and 25% premium prices. Now that leaves, of course, all the, the other 99%. And if you look at the bottom right-hand box, what happens is that you know, they, get, they get screwed on price. Of course they do, and any sensible buying director would do exactly the same thing because I can buy it anywhere. If you just look at this next slide, also from a buying director, you'll see that with 50% uh, bought-in purchases, uh, a 6% reduction in these goes straight to the bottom line. So why wouldn't any sensible customer do just this? This next slide illustrates the dramatic effect that discounting has on the bottom line. If one of your salespeople comes in, for example, and says, boss, for a 5% discount, we can keep the business. Note, we can keep it, not we can get it. Just look at the impact. For a product costing £10 and a margin of £2, selling 100, you now have to sell 33 and a third percent more just to make exactly the same profit that you made before. A 10% discount means you've got to double your sales. And if you look at the next um, slide, this is a, a crib sheet that Grant and I frequently use to save having to do lots of calculations. If you look along the top line, find the 20% margin, then look down the left column for the 5% discount, tracking along the line will locate the 33 and a third percent. To summarize, the price is only ever an issue in the absence of quantified value. And it is the supplier's job to quantify the value, not the buying organization. And that's precisely what Grant said a few minutes ago during his introduction. I've got three points on this slide. Um, there are many, many more, but you know, three important ones are how will your offer enable your customer to serve their customers better? And how will your offer enable your customer to be more competitive? But most important of all, how will dealing with you make your customers more profitable? And this is not some mealy-mouthed academic expression. Um, you must be able to prove that dealing with you will create advantage for your customer, not merely help them to avoid disadvantage. What I mean by avoiding disadvantage is that if you take just some typical products like companies, all companies need laptops, they need furniture, they need raw materials, you know, many of them need lawyers, etc., etc. But they can get these from any supplier. If you take, for example, lawyers, 
London is awash with lawyers, and they all had the same training. Um, and you can you can select a lawyer from any of those legal firms. So <clears throat> all they do by buying these things is avoid disadvantage. They will, however, we know from our research, pay a lot more if they know that dealing with you will create advantage for them. This sets out the case for financially quantified value propositions. Um, and I've already said that only 5% of companies, according to McKinsey, um, have got um, quantified value propositions. So if you develop one, it will certainly differentiate your company. And, you know, as Grant already hinted, as a buyer, 90% of the buying cycle is done before speaking to suppliers. But it's, here's an interesting finding that we've come across, that even if you don't have any differentiation, the very act of financially quantifying the benefits, even if they're standard benefits, will give you an advantage over your competitors. And these next three are so important. You'll close more deals, typically an additional 2 to 10%. The sales cycle will be reduced by between 10 and 25%, and Grant will expand on that in a few minutes. And it will help reduce discounting by um, 20 to 30%. And my last slide before I hand over to um, before I hand over to to Grant, there are additional benefits like avoidance of no or delayed decisions to buy, improved customer relationships, and referrals from satisfied customers. I mean, there isn't anybody on planet Earth who's not heard of the Net Promoter Score, and when you get referrals from satisfied customers through financially quantified value propositions, the Net Promoter Score always goes up. And that last one that you see on the screen, sustained relationships. I mean, even a 5% reduction in lot customer loss will lead to up to 75% increase in profits, unless, of course, you believe that Harvard Business Review, McKinsey, uh, Gartner, and the likes of those sorts of famous companies are telling lies. So it will lead to uh, a much um, greater um, sustained relationship. Um, uh, I'd like now, if I may, to hand over to Grant, who will expand on um, that point I just made in the previous slide. Uh, sorry, I have that muted, so I'll just come back to that slide for you. Um, the slides and the white paper will be available um, after the event. If you'd like to send me an email at that address on the screen, and we will show that to you later, I'd be delighted to send you across the slides and the white paper. This is one of my favorite slides, the sales velocity. I've used this a lot in many different businesses when I've been running sales teams. First item is the number of leads. Now, typically, we would expect marketing to be uh, pursuing that one. Uh, the closure rate, the second point, is obviously part of the sales team's activity. The average deal size, again, is the sales team. And finally, the sales cycle. Now, a lot of companies um, do use this measure. I think it's enormously helpful. And on the next slide, I'm just going to show you some examples. So on the top, let's say for the particular month, we've got 125 leads that marketing have generated. Typically, we close 20% of those. That number is quite typical across lots of different industries. And that next number, which is the deal size, obviously will vary from company to company, but we, we've used 120,000 there. And again, the sales cycle, um, in my experience working with technology, you know, this is typically three months for very big deals. It could be as much as 12 months. And that gives us a sales velocity of a million pounds per month. Now, that may be for the entire company, and you, you can, of course, become more sophisticated and break that down by sales team member. 
And as Malcolm mentioned earlier, what we know from putting together quantified value propositions is that you can increase some of these numbers. Now what I've done, I've left the number of leads exactly the same because sales teams don't have any uh, real um, benefit from increasing those. I've increased the closure rate, the, the deal size, i.e. we're doing less discounting, and I've reduced the sales cycle from three months, by t again, all by 10%. And as you can see, that gives us an increase of 34%. I shall talk about that a bit more later on. Now, Malcolm and I have defined um, financially qualified value propositions. And we've said it's the translation of the supplier's offers into monetary terms and the demonstration of the contribution to the customer's profitability. And by that profitability, we mean what's the payback, what's the return on investment, and, and what's the, um, it may even be the net present value. And those are things that, from my experience working on the buyer side, those are all the issues that the finance director is going to ask me when I put together my business case. I think what's very interesting about discounting as well, many years ago I had a sales director uh, that said to the sales team, I pay you guys to get the best deal. I couldn't employ any idiot to give it away. And of course, we're always under pressure to discount, but as Malcolm said, the, the impact on that is so significant. So what are the components of a value proposition? There are four of them. The ones that we tend to focus on are cost reduction and cost avoidance. That's numbers two and three on the list. The fourth item, the emotional contribution, these are quite difficult to quantify. Some of them that you can, but they're often more difficult. So if we go back to number one again, added value or revenue gains, Yes, that can be achieved in a value proposition. It's often more difficult to police because there's a number of factors going on. But we've seen some very good evidence that by doing things differently and quantifying value propositions, you can improve revenues. Cost reduction is where people tend to focus most of their effort, and we will show you some examples of that later on. A good, avoidant, a, a good example, I think, of cost avoidance in our world is the GDPR that's happening at the moment, the General Data Protection Regulation. And I'm sure those of you in marketing will be feeling slightly nervous because if we get it wrong, we can be fined up to 20 million euros. Again, depending on the size of the company, but that's, that's an area where we would be looking at cost avoidance and saying if we put a new system in, uh, we need to put together a value proposition for that. I'm just going to talk through a couple of examples now to, to give you some more context. We talk a lot, of, a lot about SKF. Now, SKF is a company that Malcolm and I have worked with a lot over the years. For those of you that don't know, they make ball bearings, which is not the most exciting product in the world. But they also make a bearing assemblies. Now, lots of cars, uh, airplanes, Food manufacturers use bearing assemblies for things like pumps, um, and they're widely used around the world. What this example shows from SKF, now we obviously we've changed the numbers to protect the innocent, but on the left, in red, is the price that the competitor charges, $10. On the right, in blue, is the $15 that SKF charge. So typically, they would get a 50% premium. Because what they've been able to do is work out the total cost over the lifetime of this particular bearing assembly. And the total saving to the customer would be $30.25 in this particular case. And the reason being is that SKF know that their particular products need less lubrication, less energy, less inventory. They're faster to implement uh, and there's longer uptime. And they have masses and masses of data on this. In fact, SKF have got so good at doing this that uh, they promised certain paper mills around the world that if their 
pumps failed with their particular assemblies in, they would replace uh, the pumps uh, for no charge. And they now run a number of um, paper mills which have something like 300 pumps in them around the world. I'm not suggesting that you go into uh, the business of running paper mills, but it's interesting that SKF have become so good at doing this. And here's a, quite a different example. Uh, this is a label company to a food manufacturer. And again, all of these items, you can actually go through and you can work out the real cost savings. So they know by putting this in this particular process, it's just-in-time label delivery. Uh, they can save that food manufacturer. Uh, at, it takes it down from six weeks to two weeks. That's four weeks of inventory. They can put a cost to that. Um, it reduces the stock out costs, which can be quite significant because it causes downtime on the production line. Um, they can look at what the obsolescence is because in this particular marketplace, a lot of labels are, are manufactured and then get thrown away. And they can work the cost out of that. So as you work through this, it gives you a very, very clear idea of what the return on investment is going to be for that particular food manufacturer. Now, when Malcolm and I are running workshops, we would ask people to do this. Uh, we can't get you to tell us the answers because you're on a webinar. However, I think it's worth just thinking about this for a moment. If, you are, if we ask you this question, our value propositions for relevant customers are fin financially quantified, justified, and proven. And we know, because there's been quite a lot of research published on this, that companies that have put together value propositions, only 40% of them actually believe that they're credible. So just think about that for a moment, and I'm going to hand back to Malcolm now. Thank you, Grant. It's uh, quite amusing in this uh, studio. We're at the Chartered Institute of Marketing in Cookham, um, uh, here in England, and uh, we've got one headset for us, and uh, each time we hand over, we have this uh, embarrassing pause, uh, so I hope you'll forgive us, um, but I'm afraid you've got me now for at least five or six minutes. Um, what I'd like to do now is to <clears throat> talk about the value proposition development process. All right, leave it there. Uh, and <clears throat> I mean, if you think about where you would apply the concept uh, and you know the practice of uh, value propositions, you've clearly got several levels. You've got the company level, the organizational level. You've got the strategic business unit level. You've got product level. You've got market level. You've got segment level. And of course, you've got customer level. And later on, in a few minutes' time, we're going to be talking about how you develop a financially quantified value proposition for an individual customer, a major customer. Now, clearly, as the, um, the level gets broader, the value proposition becomes more generic. But that isn't a problem in our experience. So as I say, during this webinar, we're going to concentrate on developing a financially quantified value proposition for a customer. So where do you begin the process? Well, you'll see this funny little matrix here with products listed along the top, uh, just uh, five boxes, and markets listed down the left. Uh, it doesn't mean to say that there are only four, five boxes along the top and uh, five boxes down the uh, vertical axis. You can have as many as you like. But <clears throat> what we get are clients to do during workshops is to start filling this matrix in by putting their products or product groups along the top and the markets into which each is sold down the left. And I mean, for, let me give you an example from my last job as marketing director of Canada Dry. We had about 350 products, but obviously they can be grouped into product groups. So for example, we would have fruit juices, we would have mixers, we would have pops and things like that. And on the left-hand side, we would have things like hotels, supermarkets, airlines, and so on and so forth. And <clears throat> we find that our clients can always do this. You list 
put, put the product groups along the top, markets into which they are sold down the left, and then write in your sales. And if, you, uh, if they have time and uh, if it's relevant, uh, the market size. But the point is that this always, always has and always will do lead to um, uh, the sort of 80-20. And you will find that 20% of your products for market account for 80% of your revenue. Not always profits, but uh, let's stick with revenue for the moment. As you know, it's called a Pareto curve. Um, it's called a Lorenz curve, more technically. Um, but if you complete that, what we suggest is that you do that and select one box to take forward uh, into the value proposition process. Um, <clears throat> If you look at the process itself, um, you'll see there are six uh, discrete steps. The first one I really just described to you, define your target market. You've already done that. Um, the second step is uh, identifying the buyers. Third step is added value analysis. The fourth step is financial quantification, which is the, the crucial step. Then uh, the fifth step is categorizing the outcomes. And finally, of course, you've got the issue of communicating um, the value that you've, uh, that you've quantified to your target customer. So if you go back to step two, identify buyers, this is quite a complex step because it involves mapping quantitatively the flow of goods and services from supplier through to end users. Um, <clears throat> and we are amazed how few companies actually do this and when we get them to do it, they always, without exception, say it is one of the most valuable exercises they've ever done in the history of the company. But the purpose of doing a quantified market map is to identify the 20% of influencers who determine what is bought. Uh, it is often at this stage and here that clients decide to focus on one major customer, but this isn't always the case. <clears throat> The third box, added value analysis, is where the real, real hard work and the grind begins. Um, and it is, without doubt, the major step and involves a lot of absolutely um, necessary analysis. I mean, for example, if you take um, environmental analysis, um, often it's called pests, steep, and so on and so forth, we know that today, if you just think of technology on its own, it's having a major, major impact on uh, industries and sectors and companies. And uh, you know, what we're trying to establish is how those are going to impact the customer and if there are any ways in which we can ameliorate the impact or help them to um, absorb the changes that are taking place. So that's environmental analysis. Then you get sector analysis. Now, it doesn't matter what particular uh, analysis method you choose. I mean, we like Porter's Five Forces uh, method, where you look at competitors, you look at suppliers, you look at customers, you look at potential entrants, you look at uh, substitutes. And it is remarkable how when you look at um, a sector, how it is possible to find ways as a supplier of adding value or reducing cost for um, a particular uh, sector, or sorry, a particular uh, customer. And the final piece of this analysis is company analysis. A big part of it, of course, is financial analysis. And uh, the financial analysis, particularly ratios, it, the, the, the data is always available. And again, it's, uh, it's what drives your customer, your client, your segment. And we need to understand those so that we can um, decide in what ways we can help them. And then, of course, most important of all is the value chain. Um, and Grant will give you, uh, in a few minutes' time, some uh, examples of, uh, of this in step four, uh, particularly the financial quantification um, uh, after step three. <clears throat> Boxes five and six, um, you know, now the hard work has been completed, and we've developed, uh, we have developed a unique scheme for presenting this to customers including how to communicate your findings and to whom. So again, we haven't got time to go into this uh, during this particular webinar, but what I'd like to do now is to hand over to Grant to conclude this webinar 
and then we will throw it open, obviously, for questions. So, handing over to Grant now. Thank you, Malcolm. So Malcolm's mentioned the Porter's value chain. Now this is a, so let me give you the context. So the supplier here is a software company and it's selling into a manufacturing business and the manufacturing business is, is what's described in this value chain. We've got the firm's infrastructure at the top and we've got human resources, technology development and procurement. And then going across, we've got inbound logistics, operations, outbound logistics, marketing and sales, and after-sales service. Now, one of the things that we do in a workshop is we sit down and we figure out uh, with the participants what their particular customer looks like and where our product may improve revenues, reduce costs, or avoid costs. And for this, now this is this is a company that I've I've done a lot of work with. It's a very complicated uh, solution. It's a big ERP piece of software, and they're in luck, very lucky because they've got modules that touch virtually every piece of this a value chain. So they've got offers within the accounting area at the top. They've got something for human resources. They've got something for procurement. Etc. So lots of different modules. So we, we would then sit down and say, well, okay, where does it impact the customer and what are the likely benefits? Now, these value chains, they may look complicated. Um, if you look on uh, Google, I'm sure other, um, other, in, um, other search engines are also available. But if you look on there, you'll find that you can get some very, very good examples from lots of different industries to, to give you a starting point. And of course, your customers will help you with this. So what we've done on this slide is we've taken those particular items. So if I look in the, in the second column across, we've got inbound, operations, outbound. We then, as part of the analysis, we want to describe what the customer weaknesses might be and then describe in words the opportunity for the customer. Now, depending on the product we've got, it may, not, it may not touch every area, but it may touch many of them. We then need to somehow categorize these into high, medium, and low. And finally, the, and the exciting bit is then adding some value. So is it increasing revenue? Will we reduce costs? And some of you will sit there thinking, hang on, this is going to be really difficult for us to do. What we've found, if you go back and talk to some of your customers about your particular products and services that you've delivered, you know, they're often very, very helpful to help you fill these things in. And you can put together case studies with them before working with new customers. So here's an example. Uh, we have a whole chapter on this uh, in the book that we've written. So. Again, these, the data has been changed to protect the innocent, uh, and some of this is data is quite old. But just to give you an idea, so this is a company, it's a German company called Mann, and they were late entrants into the UK market, but over a number of years, they managed to get a very large market share. But if you look at the total cost of ownership for a haulier, the actual cost of the truck is only 10%. So although they may say to you, hey, we'd like to reduce the cost of the truck and beat you down on price, if you then sit down with them and say, actually, the total cost of running uh, your truck over a period of a year uh, covers things like the fuel costs. Uh, you can see this particular example, we were able to show a, a saving of 6%. Uh, and then we would build this into our value proposition. Um, Sorry, fuel cost. Yeah, the fuel cost in total was sixty thousand pounds, and we were able to reduce, reduce it by sixty percent. Uh, this particular company was able able to say to the customer, "Well, look, what we can also do is you need less maintenance. We've got, we will have mobile maintenance vehicles available where we can bring your trucks in and keep them on the road." So it's very much thinking about the total cost rather than just the snapshot of as what does that initial purchase 
cost. Now again, there's lots of methods of doing data gathering. This is one that uh, uh, we've, we've seen and we've, we've worked with customers. A word of warning here, it's very dangerous to put these on websites and allow the customer to fill them in themselves because they do misinterpret the data. So even though you've got it available, make sure that you work through the customer with it so that you've got proper data. And again, if you don't know the answers, you can always say to them, look, typically this is what we would expect to see. And then you can work more closely with them and get some more uh, accurate data. One of the things that uh, our friends at SKF do is put together these white papers, and this is where we would like to get you to. Uh, we, we've got a white paper as well, which will be available. And I think it's important that as you work through these white papers, again, don't give away the crown jewels, but at, but at least explain the process to them and the lights, some very sort of high-level detail on the return on investments and the payback. Again, another quick example. This is Volvo, uh, where they're providing their big construction machinery. Again, they won't put this up on the website, but they will work through this with the customer. And this basically becomes their proposal document. So rather than providing you know, 50, 60 page proposals, they will produce this and the customer is then allowed up in this area to start changing some of the uh, data if they want to. Again, SKF produced this, but again, it's very tailored to the customer, um, and they produce uh, the cash flow. They show them where the break-even points are. Very, very powerful when you're doing that final negotiation with the customer. I've got two more just to show you. Uh, this one, I know it looks very complicated. Uh, it's for a software business, and again, we've, we've changed the data. Uh, a very good friend of mine uh, runs this company, in the early days, they were struggling to, to, to make uh, many sales. By using this approach, they're now, now able to close over 80% of the deals that they're working on, which is a phenomenal number. And the, one of the other clever things that they do is that when this is produced, now if, if you're in this business, this uh, particular diagram will make obvious sense to you uh, because they're, the, they're your numbers they can produce, be produced very quickly and popped into a PowerPoint. But what they do, which is really clever, is before their main presentation to the board, they will actually uh, produce these documents, laminate them, and send them out to the board of directors in the post. Uh, some of you will remember post. It's something that isn't used very often, but it does make you stand out in sales pitches. And the final one, is to go back to uh, the NHS. And again, we've changed the numbers on this. But we were struggling in the early days of presenting this. So in the NHS, like lots of companies, it has to go up through many levels of authorization. It goes to the board of a hospital, it then goes up to another committee, and then it goes up to NHS England, who will finally sign these things off. And we'd presented this 30-page document, and I'd worked very closely with all the suppliers, and we really weren't getting anywhere. People weren't reading the document. So what we did, we spun it round, turned it on its head, and we produced this one-page proposal where we put all the numbers in. We showed the return on investment. We showed the payback. And the clever trick, which I've, I've saved for last, is we've showed the monthly cost of doing nothing. And I suspect many of you don't put that in. So if you didn't go forward with this every month, we can argue that we are wasting X thousand pounds. And at the bottom in the graphs, I'm showing all the cost reductions. And when we actually finally presented this to some various senior people in the NHS, uh, they actually said, goodness, this is the first time we've actually understood what this proposal was about. And we immediately got the three million pounds signed off. So it does work. Um, and we work in lots of different industries. So finally, just to say that, um, as I mentioned earlier, the slides and white paper are available at that email address. And uh, we're pretty much on time. And we, we are going to hand over 
for questions and answers. Thank you, Malcolm and Grant. <clears throat> Uh, now we're going to begin answering the questions submitted to, during today's presentation. And as a reminder, you can still submit your questions through the question pane in your attendee control panel. So our first question is, how long should a value proposition statement be and where would you suggest displaying it? How long should a value proposition statement be? Um, value proposition statements, if you're talking, I mean, it depends which level you're talking about. But if you're talking, for example, about a major customer, it's going to, it's going to be a fairly substantial um, piece of financial calculation. And it would need to be presented uh, possibly uh, several different times to different target uh, people, influencers, riders in the major customer. But the data that you've collected and the um, financial calculations have got to be relevant to the part of the business and the person you're talking to. So you, you collect quite a substantial amount of data and information, analyze it. I mean, that slide that, you show, that Grant showed you was only one of a number of slides where you've done the quantification. And quite clearly, most of us who are listening to this webinar do understand how buying decisions are very, very rare, rarely made by one person. Um, there are quite a few people in the organization um, that you relate to. They'll all want different pieces of that information. So it's, it's about the last piece of the whole uh, quantification um, map is about getting that, uh, that understanding, what you've got to present and who you've got to present it to, getting that bit of the of the equation right. Can I, can I just add, if I, I go back, and hopefully you can see this on the screen, if I go back to the uh, financial model of the dashboard that I showed earlier, uh, what, what this software vendor is doing is, and that is the only slide they present in the presentation. That's what they go through. They don't, they don't put any, anything else in. And I think, you know, we're, we're all suffering from data overload and the last thing I want to read is another 30-page 30 30 presentation. You can reduce it down to that and explain it to me. These are the things that I think of. Okay, do we, do we have another question? I don't know whether anybody could hear, but... Oh, should you have one value proposition or change it for different sectors and target personas? Hello, Sam. Sorry, could you just repeat that question? Of course, no problem. Should you have one value proposition or change it for different sectors and target personas? Um, sorry, Sam, we just had a technical problem here. Could you just repeat that question again? Um, of course. Should you have one value proposition or change it for different sectors and target personas? OK. Um, the answer is yes, it, yes it, will, it will be different for different, different sectors. So you know, if you're selling into the automotive sector or you're selling into the food manufacturers, it will be different depending on the sector. But I mean, there, there will be some similarities, but the, the specific savings or the specific cost avoidance that you're lo looking at will be different sector by sector. Thank you. Uh, another question is, could the same principles of cost saving be applied to B to Z value propositions, for example, for a financial services product? Yeah, let me, let me repeat that question for Malcolm. Um, 
I'm not sure quite what the uh, what the point of the question is, but if you're in financial services, that is a sector that lends itself absolutely brilliantly to this process. And I mean, the point about all processes, like um, for example, strategy development, marketing strategy development, the process is universal. Um, the steps that you take are universal. The only thing that differs is, uh, you know, the actual sort of detail and the data. But uh, yes, I mean, we've done work in financial services and the process works absolutely perfectly. Um, and as I say, you know, it works at, uh, it works at um, sector level, it works at segment level, although uh, it's much easier um, to make the process that we've described to you work at uh, segment level and below that. But it works absolutely brilliantly once you have identified a major customer um, for, you know, that you would like to deal with. And then it becomes, that process really becomes a process of um, uh, value co-creation. Co co You're creating value with the customer um, and, you know, this is what, um, you know, 3M, General Electric, Siemens, DuPont, and, uh, you know, all the best companies in the world do. And, of course, we know that the Procter & Gamble's and the Unilever's have to do it with their, their own major customers and their own major sectors. But, yes, the answer is it works absolutely brilliantly and perfectly in the financial services sector. I wish we could see more of it in that particular sector. Thank you, Malcolm. Um, another question we have is, is there a risk with value propositions, such as these would give a very accurate targets to compete against for competitors, and what's the trade-off between the engagement with the customer versus the risk of reaction by the competitor? Um, okay, it's a very good question. Um, obviously, um, you, you're going to want, um, if possible, you know, not, not to make this freely available to, uh, to the, to the comp competition. Um, and I think certainly from my experience, you know, where, where I'm, I'm talking to a number of suppliers about a different product, we, we wouldn't share that, that information with, uh, you know, all the suppliers. It's confidential to that supplier. Um, and again, my experience is, you know, it, it's, is this particular um, value proposition credible? Because, you know, I, 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 see, I do see them uh, and you look at them and think, well, this doesn't make any sense. Um, and they've probably not sat down and talked to anyone in the particular sector to get a to get an idea of whether it's credible or not. So I, I think customers generally, you know, if or, or potential customers, if you ask them to treat these things confidentially, they will. Um, and of course, it's you know, as I said earlier, don't publish these things on websites or put them into white papers, you know, with all the all the detail in them because that that does is a real giveaway. Thanks, Grant. Um, the next question is, what would your advice be for demonstrating relative value when you have limited visibility of competitor pricing? Yes, yeah, another good question. Um, I th again, I think what, what people finish up doing is it, it's not just about the price. So, you know, your price might may be different to other people's price, but it's really about the value that you deliver. As I said earlier with SKF, you know, they will charge 50% more, but still demonstrate that they're, they're giving much greater value than the, than the competition. And in, in lots of cases, yes, it, it's sometimes difficult to understand what the, what the competitor might be charging. Um, but I think it's for you to show what's the payback and what, what's the return on investment. Because at the end of the day, most sophisticated buyers and finance directors, that's what they're interested in. Thanks, Grant. Um, another question is, which one of the steps do you find is most critical for success and where the pro biggest problems can be expected? Okay, I'm going to pass that one over to Malcolm, just one second. Oh, I think the question, uh, we have a very, very slight technical problem here that uh, only one of us can hear the questions. Um, of the six steps, uh, I have got no doubt in my mind that 
the most important of the lot is the um, data analysis, the data collection and data analysis. But there is um, a step before that, and it's related to what I guess was the last question. Uh, Grant and I do um, some work with the European Institute of Purchasing in Geneva, um, and it's fascinating when you get a group of buyers together, you know, buying directors. And I was at one of these um, conferences. I was, you know, running a half-day workshop for the European Institute of Purchasing. And I actually asked the buying directors how many of them um, actually buy on price uh, as a deliberate policy. And unfortunately, this was about five years ago, it was about 60% of them which meant that only 40% of them bought on price. Now, an interesting thing is that those um, 60% who bought on price, most of them realized that they were giving the company's money away by buying on price and realized they should be buying on value, but their boards of directors, their bosses, targeted them on getting prices down. Now, we know that all those companies, and again, we've got, masses of data about this, those companies, those customers that buy on value are infinitely more profitable than those who buy on price. So the step that goes before, you know, selecting your target market for whom to do financial, um, financially quantified value pr propositions is a key step. Because if you've got a customer um, who, no matter what you do, will still drive the price down, then what's the point um, of wasting all that time and effort and money. Um, the good news is there are sufficient uh, organizations around who really do understand the concept of value, and they're the ones that you've got to target. And I'll tell you what, the process works absolutely brilliantly for those organizations. And isn't it interesting, just as an aside, um, you know, when I, um, here we are in 2018, and recently I had 110 people from good companies. Um, I won't say where it was, but it was in a big, big lecture room. I explained what financially quantified value propositions were and asked them, Chatham House rules, how many have got them? Of the 110 people, only four hands went up. Now, on Monday, yesterday, I was at a conference doing a keynote. There were 1,000 people there. And I asked them all, I said, how many of you got rubbish products? And I know hands went up. And then I said, how many of you got brilliant products? Every hand went up. And the point I was making to them is that today all products are brilliant. So you're not going to get differential advantage from the product. You're going to get it from the way you relate to your customers and your markets, which is where um, financially quantified value propositions come in. Um, and it's remarkable, I think, that let's take the McKinsey figure, that here we are in 2018 and only 5% of companies have bothered to, to, to do them. And the process is not easy. It requires intellect, it requires data, it requires application, and that is a million miles removed um, for those who are still uh, hanging on and listening to this webinar. That's a million miles removed from selling and you know benefit analysis and all that kind of stuff that I was taught as a young lad. So I think that that's probably, um, I'm not quite sure how long we've got. We're, have we got time for any more questions? Yes, Malcolm, I can, I can probably do another more question, a couple more questions. Um, okay, we'll have a couple more questions. Is this process more difficult for startups and new growth companies? Uh, is it more difficult for, for, for growth companies and startup companies? My experience is that it is actually much more difficult for a big organization that has got um, <clears throat> politics and departments and uh, cultures and ingrained systems and procedures. We all know the sort of stuff I'm talking about. We've all experienced it in our lives. Um, you know, truly, truly dreadful. It's, it's like sort of walking through porridge, you know, trying to get anything done. Um, it's much more difficult to get this process installed and become part of the um, operating procedures in large organizations. With small companies, they get it straight away. They can make decisions. They can choose. They can get on with it. 
And, um, you know, we found it much easier, for example, Grant and I, when we ran workshops in, um, for, we, we had six SMEs in one room together at one stage, and it was absolutely brilliant, and it takes much longer in a big, complicated political organization. Um, sorry to say that, but I'm sure you all know exactly what I mean. More questions? Thanks, Malcolm. Yeah. Um, have you created a persuasive case or justification document that a supplier could put to their boss internally to help change the buy on price mindset? Uh, well, we, we hope so. I mean, the reason we've written a book um, and the reason we spend time at the European Institute of uh, Purchasing in Geneva is for precisely that reason because the buying side has to be uh, persuaded as much as the selling side. But my experience over the years, and remember I did say at the beginning that I formed this uh, Global Best Practice Key Account Management Research Club at Cranfield uh, over 20 years ago with fabulous, fabulous companies in it. Um, you know, uh, and I, I, can, I can tell you that um, my experience is that the buying side, on, in the main, is more sophisticated um, and more financially literate than the, than the supplying side. And that seems to be Grant's experience as well as uh, an interim buying director at the National Health Service. Um, and, you know, it's, it's rather sad. I mean, if you think about key account management, we have to move away from the notion of selling. Nobody wants to be sold to. Um, remember the statistic I gave you in one of my slides that 90% of the buying cycle is done before a, a sales representative turns up. They don't want any of that stuff. And even worse, the last thing they want are gangs of salespeople turning up, flogging products. Many of the best companies in the world that we work with, you know, salespeople aren't allowed to mention the product. They talk about the company, the customer, and their problems. And only later on, does you know their product and their solutions come into play um so um you know it's um i'm not claiming any of this stuff is easy but we're on a mission grant and i i'm a lot older than grant my uh, mission in life is to get this stuff promulgate best practice get this stuff adopted um so that um you know we can all be a lot better off and a lot happier um but I'm not claiming it's easy. Most of this stuff is quite difficult, and as I say, requires intellectual, um, it, it requires training, it requires, I mean, for example, if you think about it, some of the material that we've presented today, um, you're not gonna be able to do it unless you have got at least a minimum of financial acumen, for example, um, and a lot of business acumen. And, you know, it's, that's a million miles removed from turning up and trying to flog stuff. Those days, I think, are well and truly behind us, but I don't think the world has really realized that yet. Okay, that's, Thanks, that's the Malcolm. end of my rant. <laughs> <laughs> and the last question we have today is, can the value proposition be something other than monetary? For example, community capital, ethics, or environment? Uh, yes, yes, it can. Um, and... Indeed, we, we glossed over that uh, fourth element of the components of a value proposition. Um, we know that, um, I mean, there are ways of, uh, of quantifying these things. For example, you can quantify customer equity, you can quantify, um, uh, you can quantify um, brand equity, um, you can quantify, uh, for example, the benefits of um, segmentation, if you're giving the right message to the right people uh, in an organization or in a segment, then, you know, price tends, in our experience, price tends to disappear from the equation. So that emotional bit is absolutely fundamental. And I have got 127 scholarly references to prove that financial success is related to proper needs-based segmentation, proper positioning and branding um, and you know I, I'd, I'd love to be able to run a webinar on this but uh, that's for a different occasion but the, the more qualitative stuff is a big big part of value propositions and we haven't talked about it much today but we have written about it in the book which is coming out I think on the 3rd of October um, so 
I think what I will say to you is, um, for those who are uh, hanging on and still listening, um, I'm sitting here with Grant in front of a screen, which is totally different from and you know, talking to um, people I can't see, whereas yesterday I had a thousand people. I could see their faces. I could get a response from them. It was absolutely wonderful. So I hope you'll forgive Grant and me if we haven't been totally fluent today in the way we've handled the technology and the way we've handled the questions. But it's been a pleasure to have you all along. And uh, just remember, today all products are excellent, so it's going to be the way you relate to your markets and customers that makes you rich. And that's where financially quantified value propositions come into play. So thank you all for listening to us, and best of luck. Thank you to everyone for attending today's webinar, and thank you to Malcolm and Grant. Once you leave today's webinar, you'll receive a survey on the presentation, and we would appreciate if you would complete that and provide your feedback. You will also receive a follow-up email within one to two working days with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. On behalf of CIM and our presenters, Malcolm and Grant, thank you for joining us today, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day.